Heads up, we make adult reviews for adult gamers. For a thousand years, the ash has fallen upon our world. The Lord Ruler has reigned through terror, his throne divinely invincible. A few privileged nobles rise above the fray, 12 houses who scheme against another for their place in his court. Power is not measured in wealth or connections, but in secrets. Only one house can rise to glory, for this is Mistborn, House War. Hey everyone, Farce from Two Bats Gaming here, and today we'll be taking a look at Mistborn House War, a tabletop game for 3 to 5 players that runs between 45 and 120 minutes. Designed by the seasoned and successful Kevin Wilson and published by Crafty Games, Mistborn House War is based on the best selling fiction series Mistborn by Brian Sanderson. The game currently retails for around $45 US. In the interest of full disclosure, we received a free copy of Mistborn House War from the publishers for the purposes of review. As always, this did not affect our opinion of the game. We're here for the players, not the publishers. And now, let's hop into the review. I'd like to begin, if I may, with Aristotle and his relation to a grilled cheese sandwich. More precisely, let me draw your attention to a quote from the preeminent philosopher. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Two pieces white bread, a bit of butter, a slice of cheddar cheese, and maybe some garlic salt if you're feeling adventurous. Elements which, when taken on their singular parts, amount to very little, but throw them together, add a bit of heat, and good God Almighty is the result divine. In short, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And that's how I feel about Mistborn House War. You have a game, when examined myopically through its base mechanics, its most simple involvements with those who play it, appears to be not much. The premise is simple. There's an empire, you're a noble in said empire, and you begin with a deck of problems. The problems are basic representations, or descriptions to be more apt, of those that might beset any burgeoning empire. The need for rationing of food stores, spies within the government, outbreaks of plague. Mechanically speaking, problems come with an assigned severity ranking from 1 to 3, representing their relation to how badly they threaten the empire itself. The range is somewhere from incidents of local thuggery all the way to seize the means of production, comrade. Now the main goal of the game is to solve these problems. Neglect to solve said problems and they'll become worse over time, quickly marching their way up the board until they erupt. In scientific terms, the feces impacts the oxygen oscillating device and everyone gets to take a bite of the Cal Pratty croissant. Mechanically speaking, when a player's turn begins, each problem on the board matches up one column in the problem table. Move past the fourth column and the problem then erupts, which usually carries some nasty implications for one or all of the players. However, eruption can take on a bit of a different path in Mistborn. More on this later. So, how do you solve problems? Well, through the use of resources. Each problem card has a number of symbols on it, representing what players will need to contribute in order to remove the problem card from the board. There's six different types of resources, and players will gain these resources based on which house they play as. Houses are representations of various families, clans, or organizations of nobility that seek influence in the court of the final empire. Each house is subservient to the Lord Ruler, who is basically Mr. Dictator Supreme of said empire. No player takes on his role, he's just assumed to exist for the sake of the narrative. As for the houses, there's 12 to choose from, each a bit different from the other, so there's a wide variety of options that offer a good choice of playstyles. Each house begins their turn by collecting whatever resources are displayed on their house card. There is a finite supply of resources, which can lead to a bit of competition to secure the right ones for a particular game. Anyways, back to problems. Should a player throw the necessary resources at a problem, it is considered solved and thus removed from the board. A certain number of points are awarded to the solving player, basically more for bigger problems, and then the game rolls on. However, I should note something. The catch about problems is... And at this point, I feel like I should mention I am referring to Mistborn, not life itself, although the advice probably applies to either. Anyways, the catch about problems is that they can rarely be solved alone. To elaborate, the resource requirements on the problem cards can usually not be fulfilled solely by a single player. Therefore, negotiation enters into Mistborn, and enters into it in a big way. It is the meat and potatoes of Mistborn, and its focus mainly revolves around the idea of solving the aforementioned problems. Mistborn follows the standard convention of each player taking a turn on their own, one after another. 
On a player's turn, they control the hot seat. In other words, they get to decide which problem they'll attempt to solve on their turn, and they also get to decide who's allowed to take part in the negotiations over gathering the needed resources to solve said problem. To entice other players to enter into the deal, they can offer some, or all if they're stupid, of the points that will be awarded should said problem be solved. There's no set rules on how you can split the points. It's entirely up to the active player. Furthermore, there's no real rules on the negotiation process itself. The rulebook literally encourages you to house rule in anything you desire. So, promise resources, promise to protect the player on a later turn, promise whatever variety of kinky sex your deviant mind can come up with. It's all allowed. And, oh yeah, deals aren't binding. Feel free to lie your ass off, but be prepared for the consequences of your conniving ways. Luckily, players aren't solely at the mercy of their predefined ration of resources in Mistborn. There's an aspect that adds a ton of intrigue, complexity, and tension to the negotiation process, and that is the personality card deck. Besides the resources received on a player's turn, each player also draws a specific number of personality cards from this deck on every turn. Personality cards are where the action in Mistborn comes in. They can be played at various points throughout the game. Some, like those that let you steal other players' cards, might be played on your turn. Others, which can make a deal more or less difficult, might be played on another player's turn when they're making a deal. And finally, you have lasting personalities, which basically stick around from turn to turn like an enchantment and can give you extra resources, let you draw more personality cards on your terms, whatever, you get the point. It's these personality cards that add the action to Mistborn. The negotiation is the drama. The personalities are the punches and dodges. Quite often, you'll be in the middle of a deal, working out the splits of points and making sure everyone's got enough of certain resources. You shake on it, and bam! Some festering fuckwit will drop a personality that means you need more resources than you thought, and thus the deal falls apart. Now, you might be asking yourself a question here. If players are awarded points for successfully negotiating a deal, and each player involved in that deal can usually barter for some share of those points, why would it behoove anyone save for a megalomaniac to sour a deal? Even if they were trying to stop a runaway player, it's ultimately a zero-sum game, right? Well, that's where the cherry on top of the Mistborn cake comes into play. And this does require a bit of explanation. See, the length of a game of Mistborn is decided by a singular card in the problem deck, and it goes by the name of Vin. When the Vin problem card appears, players have until either it is solved or erupts, and then the game ends. Now that on its own is not an issue, it's the unrest score where the twist comes into play. Throughout the game, certain problems, sometimes when solved, sometimes when erupting, can up the game's unrest score, represented by this unrest track. Should the game end with an unrest score of 7 or lower, then the player with the most favor, in other words the most points, wins the game. However, if the unrest score is at 8, and to be completely clear here, the game ends immediately if the unrest score ever reaches 8, then the player with the least amount of favor, in other words the lowest score, wins the game. Now normally speaking, no one wants the unrest track to hit 8, and thus will work together to prevent such a thing from happening. But there's a twist. It's possible to score negative favor in the game. It's called disgrace. Generally speaking, it enters into Mistborn when a player solves a problem. They get to apply a certain amount of disgrace to another player, thus lowering the target player's score. Now, the more devious amongst you may see the complication here, though. While you may want to team up against the runaway king in a game, if you all do so, you run the risk of enticing him to run the game out through the unrest track, a feat which is certainly possible given a sufficiently motivated madman. Scores are kept private in this game, so unless you're going all Rain Man, you'll usually not know how much favor or disgrace another player has. And that brings me back to the beginning. Mistborn is greater than the sum of its parts. When viewed from a simple mechanical principle, nothing here is complicated. Nothing is necessarily revolutionary. The beauty of Mistborn lies not in the game itself, but rather in the metagame. The negotiation, the backstabbing, the careful balance between deterring your opponent's plans while smiling to their face all the while. Mistborn is a case study in interpersonal politics. It's Machiavelli's The Prince in an hour-long format. Is it the first game to introduce diplomacy and all the nastiness that comes with it? No, certainly not. 
but it is the careful consideration to detail of its individual parts and the composition of these parts when added together that make it so delicious. It's mean enough to make you feel like a mastermind when you've won, but not so full of schemes that you'll need to watch your back after a session or two. Anyways, that's diplomacy's territory. Mistborn is not a complex game when viewed through just its rulebook and components. But much like the humble grilled cheese, the right ingredients, when combined together, can make a very beautiful thing. Mistborn's parts, while not amazing on their own, combine to something much greater, a game that brings a hell of a lot to the table. One recommendation for Mistborn, the game is much better when experienced with those whom you know and love, or at least love to hate. Play this game with a table full of new acquaintances and it will most likely be a polite affair, all smiles and handshakes above the board. Play this game with people who will respect your ability to be an outright conniving evil bastard and yet still respect you in the morning, in other words, what I like to call friends, and you will experience the true thrill of Mistborn. It is in the backstabbing, the intrigue, that Mistborn really comes alive. In fact, this brings up one of the little touches in Mistborn that I think is an excellent addition. There's two personality cards, the Obligator and the High Prefect, that anyone, if they have them in their hand, can play after a deal is made, and they essentially make the terms of that deal binding. See, normally you're welcome to make any deal you like, and then flip on that deal quicker than North Korea on a yellow cake uranium bender. But with these two cards, there's always the threat that you'll be held to your word, however half-hearted your promises may be. I've seen these cards used to ridiculous effect, watch people argue over the terms of what harm you later meant like a pack of Beverly Hills divorce attorneys, and all the while, it's been hilariously entertaining. Finally, one thing I cannot comment on is how well the adaptation of Mistborn to the tabletop holds true to the novels from whence it gets its name. Put more simply, I haven't read the books, despite their overwhelming popularity. Apparently, Brandon Sanderson, the author of the Mistborn series, has given his seal of approval to the game, or at least its sales. I will say this, playing Mistborn House War has sufficiently inspired me to read the Mistborn series, and it's on my backlog of books to check out. So, to answer the question, should you spend your money on Mistborn? Well, that comes down to two things. One, you don't mind indulging in an occasional bout of backstabbery, and two, you have a group of players who don't mind being the target of said spinal knife application, or in fact, mind targeting you as well. Should you meet those requirements, then I can highly recommend Mistborn. It's given my group a taste of diplomacy, both the game and the concept, in an easy to explain and quick to play package. One cool thing I should mention is that you can tweak the length of your session by where you randomly seed the problem deck with the Vim card. You can go anywhere from around 45 minutes to a few hours. Also, I think much like the books, some people will inevitably compare this to the Game of Thrones board game. Now, I don't have a lot of experience with the GOT game, but what I can say is that Mistborn feels more streamlined, quicker to play, and easier to understand for newer players. There's no territory to be gained or lost in Mistborn, and much less mechanical complexity. It's not that I prefer Mistborn over GOT. They're kind of too different in levels of complexity to really make a fair determination. However, speaking solely of Mistborn, I can say that I've highly enjoyed playing it, especially in a group of five good friends. If it sounds like your sort of thing, I definitely recommend checking it out. Until next time, enjoy your games, and as always, take it easy. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting us through our Patreon, available through a link in the video description. Our patrons gain access to our monthly tabletop trash series, where we play some of the worst board games ever designed. Consider it our masochistic gift to you.